Signal Gasoline. Let every traffic signal remind you, you do go farther with Signal Gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with Signal. The Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood Signal Dealer bring you another curious story by The Whistler. Tonight, Summer Thunder. I am The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. There is a curious connection between an entry in the records of the British Weather Bureau and a corresponding item in the annals of the Police Department of Plymouth. The first indicates that at 9 p.m. on the night of August 18th, 1937, tourists and vacationers on the southern channel coast of England were disturbed by a radio warning. Attention, all vessels in channel waters between Lands End, Cornwall and Beachy Head, Sussex. Low pressure area approaching rapidly from the southwest. Violent storm in prospect. Put into the nearest port immediately. I repeat that. Attention, all vessels in channel waters between Lands End. The heat was oppressive, deadly. The atmosphere was so heavy and damp that breathing was an achievement. People at the watering places of Torquay and Brixham couldn't sleep and tried to pass the night over tall drinks and sodden bridge games on their verandas. So much for the weather report. The police records indicate that on the same night, a night when the heat had put everyone in southern England on edge, murder was taking shape in the mind of at least one human being... It began in Plymouth, in the second floor apartment of Terry Elliott. Claudia, oh for heaven's sake, where have you been? I've been calling all over town for you. I'm sorry, Terry. It's nine o'clock. I know it's nine o'clock. Well, why didn't you call? I thought I'd better wait. Will you come to the point? Terry. I'm sorry, dear. This blast of the heat's getting on my nerves, I suppose. I know. Now, come on. Let's sit down here and I'll explain. Now, I... I know this is going to be difficult for you, dear. I want you to try and understand. What are you getting at, Claudia? I've been up to Ivy Bridge. What do you mean? I've just had a talk with your Uncle Rodney. Claudia, you had no oh, right please, to... Terry, let me finish. He realizes now how very foolish it was to disinherit you. I think it was a good idea. For the first time in my life, I'm free. <laughs> well, listen, Claudia. I know him like a book. He's frustrated. He doesn't know which way to turn. He's discovered for once that there's something his filth the money won't buy for him. He can't pull strings anymore and watch me jump about like a marionette. Terry, you don't understand. I'm afraid I do. Did he call you? No, it, it was your aunt. Agatha? She's, she knows better than that. She's only trying to make peace in the family, Perry. I tell you I don't want his money. Is that clear? He changed his will. Let him leave it that way. I said he's sorry about it. He wants to apologize. Apologize? Wait a minute. Do you know why it all happened? He didn't approve of you. He said I'd married a social climber. That I was dragging the noble name of Elliot in the mud. (laughs) Claudia, I can't understand how you could fall for it. I said I'll forgive him, Perry. I see. He's bought you off like the rest of them. Perry, you're not being fair. And you're not very perceptive. Don't shout at me. Very well. Cigarette? No, thank you. Do you have a match? I don't know what's become of my lighter. Here you are. Thanks. Well, Perry? Claudia, darling. Tonight, for the first time in my life, I feel quite capable of killing a man. Perry! I'm rather pleased about it. It'll put me on equal terms with Uncle Rodney. What do you mean? I'm going to see him, dear. When? Now. (laughs) 
two hours later, an unreal calm settled around Plymouth. Nothing stirred. Crickets stopped chirping. Trees suddenly became very still. And the bridge players paused to note there was an electric feeling in the air. The mind of the murderer was tense, too. Like the atmosphere. <laughs> Then it hit. Bridges washed out. Roads became bogged. And shortly after midnight, the telephone rang in Claudia Elliott's apartment. Yes? Claudia. Oh, yes, Aunt Agatha. What is it? Something terrible has happened. Rodney's dead. Where's Perry? I don't know. He and Rodney had a terrible scene about money or something. Did you... Did you notify the police? The inspector will be here directly. I'd better come out right away. Here's something for you drivers to think about. Do all Chevrolets get the same number of miles per gallon of gas? Do all Fords? Of course not. For it's an established fact that the mileage you get depends on three things. The condition of your car, the way you drive, and the kind of gasoline you use. Well, those first two factors, they're up to you. But when it comes to gasoline, that's where I come in. For the same company that sponsors the Whistler, Signal Oil Company, also makes the gasoline that's become famous throughout the West as the go-farther gasoline. Yes, for years, wise Western drivers who kept careful record of mileage found you do go farther with Signal gasoline. But what's most important is that even today, you still go as far as before the war with Signal. And I'll tell you why. You see, although certain high-octane anti-knock ingredients are reserved for war, the mileage ingredients which made pre-war signal famous are still in today's signal formula. And what's more, new hydrocarbons rich in mileage have even been added. Oh, but you're not interested in chemical formulas. You're interested in miles. And there's an easy way to prove that for yourself. Invest your next gas stamps at one of the friendly stations displaying signals yellow and black circle signs. Let your own car prove that it's as true today as before the war. You do go farther with Signal Gasoline. And now, back to the Whistler. You're stunned, Claudia, as you hang up the phone. You aren't conscious of the storm raging outside. All you can hear is Perry's voice over and over saying, Tonight I feel quite capable of killing a man. He should be home in a while, Claudia. What can you do? What can you say to him now? No, he couldn't have done it. He mustn't even think of it. Go out to Ivy Bridge and see the inspector. Find out for yourself. Better take a coat. Perry's raincoat hanging on the rack near the door. Yes, it's going to be a rough trip. But you arrive safely. Evening, madam. Hello, Edmund. Is the inspector here yet? Not yet, madam. I expect the storm will delay him considerably. Where's Aunt Agatha? Upstairs, madam. Be down directly. Edmund, tell me what happened. Where is Rod? I mean, the body. In his room, on the floor. Exactly where I found him. You found him? Yes, madam. I found him. You... You don't seem very disturbed, Edmund. I'm not, madam. I see you. For 20 years I served him. Now I'm through. No, madam. I'm not uh, disturbed. Oh. What are you looking for? Oh, I... I I had some cigarettes somewhere. There's some on the table. Oh, thank you. Yeah, she's there, too. Oh, thanks. I've got a lighter. Could I take your coat, madam? Thank you. Hmm. Get a soaking, madam. Edmund. May I see the body? 
Well, I don't know, madam. The inspector said to leave everything as it oh, was. please, it's very important. I won't touch anything. Very well. This way. In here, madam. Oh. He was strangled with a chain. The marks are still in his throat. A chain? Oh, but his head, all bloody. He was struck first, madam. Oh, no. No, he couldn't have done it. Oh, Gary. Oh, Gary. Come along, madam. Oh, Claudia. Claudia, dear, where are you? Oh, Aunt Agnes. Claudia, darling. Why did you take her in there, Edmund? He asked me to, madam. You should have known better. There, dear. You may go, Edmund. Oh, it wasn't, Terry, Aunt Agnes. Oh, really, it wasn't. She said some awful things, but really... Just a minute, dear. Oh, no. I said you may go, Edmund. We won't need you anymore tonight. Very well, madam. <laughs> Aunt Agatha, I must try and call Perry. He may be home by now. You can't, dear. The lines are down. I just tried. Oh, what can I do? I'm sure he didn't do it. Of course he didn't. I'd better go back. The roads are impossible, dear. You'd be taking an awful chance. I know it, but I... Now suppose you get some rest. <laughs> the storm will very likely blow itself out before morning, and you can go back to town with the inspector. <laughs> Yes, Claudia, you could use some rest, but you lie awake until three in the morning telling yourself over and over that Perry had nothing to do with it, never quite believing yourself. You finally drop off to sleep only to find Perry smiling at you from a hundred angles as he toys with a short length of chain. You're trying to tell him, trying to explain, but he continues to smile and tie loops and knots in the chain until finally... Morning. Six o'clock by your watch. All you can think of now is finding him. You dress hurriedly and leave while the others are still asleep. The storm has passed, the sky is blue, and the morning air is cool in your face as you drive back to town to your apartment. The bed's been slept in, and piled in a heap on the closet floor are the clothes Perry wore last night the navy blue jacket and white linen pants sodden and muddy. You lay them out on the floor and then there's a suspicious looking stain on the left leg of the white trousers. Quickly, go through the pockets. A card with a red smear on it, a fingerprint in blood. Now the coat. In the right outside pocket. A short length of chain. Oh no, Perry. No. Yes? Inspector Dutton, city police calling. Is this Mrs. Elliot? Yes. We're detaining your husband here at headquarters, Mrs. Elliot. Oh, could, could I speak to him? He's being questioned at the moment. If you don't mind, I'd like to come out and have a look at your apartment. Oh, of course. I know. I'll be out in 20 minutes. Very well. Claudia, that puts it up to you, doesn't it? You can go one way or the other. You can produce the piece of chain and the blood-stained linen trousers and see Perry safely off to the gallows. Or you can do what you really want to. After all, does it matter what he's done if you love him? You better decide, Claudia. There isn't much time. First, you burn the card. Then connect the electric iron, get out soap and warm water and a bottle of benzene. Blood is nasty stuff to get out, isn't it? It takes a lot of scrubbing. But finally it's gone. No trace. You iron it partly dry and rumple it up. There, a little dust from the floor and you can't tell it's been touched. But what can you do with the chain? There's the inspector. Quickly, Claudia, put it anywhere. In your purse, that's it. Good morning, Inspector. How do you do, Mrs. Elliot? You returned rather early from Marjorie Bridge, didn't you? I was quite concerned about Perry. We couldn't get through on the telephone. Did you think of calling at headquarters? Well, I, I just arrived when you telephoned. I see. Now, uh, let's take a look, eh? 
Mr. Elliot presumably slept in this room last night? Yes. You haven't disturbed anything? No. Mm-hmm. Ah, yeah. Ah, here we are. Are these the clothes that he wore last night? Yes. Blue jacket and white linen trousers. I'll take these along if you don't mind. Let me see. Hmm. What is it? Nothing in the pockets, eh? Well, I suppose he emptied them when he changed clothes. I'm afraid your husband is getting into this thing rather deeply, Mrs. Elliot. What do you mean? I think you'd better come along. Oh, couldn't I? Couldn't I drop down later, perhaps a half hour? I'd like to clean up and... It's rather a peculiar position to take, Mrs. Elliot. Perhaps you aren't aware of the fact that your husband's life is at stake. I... I realize that, Inspector. I'll get my purse. Yes, Claudia, your husband's life is at stake. And you realize as you ride to headquarters with Inspector Dutton that his fate may depend on what you do with that short piece of chain in your purse. Oh, Inspector. Huh? I've got a frightful headache. Would you mind stopping for a minute at that chemist? I'd like to get an aspirin. Well, of course. I'll get it for you. Oh, no, please. Well, I insist. It'll only take a moment. Oh, but I'd rather. I'll be back in a jiffy. You can still get rid of it, Claudia. Look, here comes a dump truck. It's filled with dirt. Throw it in the bag. Ready? Now. Missed it. You see it, Claudia, lying there in the street next to the car. Pick it up. Hurry. Oh. Here he comes. The sewer right next to the car. Coming around the other side, he can't see you. Throw it. Oh. Oh, here we are. Well, they didn't have any aspirin. Will a bromide do? Oh, yes. Yes. That will be splendid. Reeves? Uh, yes, Inspector? Uh, Mr. Reeves, uh, this is Mrs. Elliot. How do you do, ma'am? Would you get Mr. Elliot, please? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, he's right here in the next room. Sit down, please. Thank you. Come in, Mr. Elliot. Hello, Claudia. Perry. Sit down, Elliot. Now, I want the complete story this time. I must warn you that anything that you say may be used in evidence against you. Take it down, Reed. Yes, sir. I've said it so often, I know it's by heart. I'll say it again. I left Uncle Rodney's at 11.15. At 11.30, the storm broke and I got stuck in the mud about halfway home. I was there for three hours, no. That's that juicy poor alibi. I told you I can prove it. The chap who stopped to help with... Well, what about him? I asked him for his card. I was going to try to find him and well, reciprocate. What's his name? I didn't even read it. The card's in the pocket of my blue jacket, though. You can call him. The card isn't in the pocket, Mr. Elliot. You can see for yourself. Here. Why, why I don't know how... Why, it was there last night. I... All right. Where's the chain? What chain? Perry. Wait a minute, Claudia. I told you, Inspector, the man tried to pull me out of the ditch with a chain, but but the chain broke. I remember putting the odd piece in my pocket. Now, what have you done with it? I haven't done anything with it. That jacket's exactly the way I found it on the floor of your closet. You are lying, Inspector. It's got to be there. It's not there. You can see for yourself. All right. When the motor went there, he thought he might... It might be a clogged petrol line, so we drained a quarter or so of ethyl from this petrol tank to fill the carburetor. I spilled some on my trousers. I remember there was a red stain on them when I got in this morning. I I never use ethyl petrol, do I, Claudia? Do I? Oh, Perry, I... Here are the trousers, Elliot. Look at them. Why, I... What? You see, Elliot? They don't have much of an alibi. Why, I don't know. I... And furthermore, can you explain the cut on your hands? They look very much as if you took too tight a grip on a chain. They'd quite a bit, didn't they? I, I was holding on to the shackle when he pulled me out. It was a chain. Oh, of course. It's... It's a frame-up, Inspector. Someone's been in my apartment. No one's been in your apartment. Except your wife. Claudia. You. Oh, I don't know what... Take him back, Reeves. Oh, That'll be all. Yes, sir. You don't need to assist her, Reeves, thank you. I can make it alone. 
<laughs> oh, no, it's difficult, Mrs. Elliot. <laughs> oh, they can't convict him on that kind of evidence. Just because he can't prove he was somewhere else. It'll go a long way. <laughs> we have more positive evidence, of course. What? We know, for example, that he was in the bedroom of the deceased about the time he was killed. Oh, you're wrong. Oh, listen, Inspector, you've got to believe me. This may sound fantastic, but it's true. I destroyed that evidence. I burned the card. I cleaned the rest spot in the trousers. What are you talking about? I tell you, I did. Why? Because, because I thought Terry had done it. The card had a bloody thumbprint on it. I thought the pink stain in the trousers was blood. I thought I was protecting him. What about the chain? I thought that was was what he killed Uncle Rodney with. Hmm, what did you do with that? I threw it in the sewer by the chemist when you went in for the aspirin. That's why I wanted you to stop. I'm oh, sorry, Mrs. Elliot. You... You don't believe me? No. Of course, we'll check, but... Uh, uh, Reeves. Yes, sir? Take the lady home. Oh, thank you, please. I said I'm sorry, Mrs. Elliot. Good day. Well, Claudia, you're finally beginning to grasp the horror of the thing you've done. You couldn't have made a smoother job of it if you tried to frame your husband. There's no way out. Or is there? You do believe Perry, don't you? He didn't do it. But if he didn't, who did? Rodney wasn't what you'd call a model of popularity. He had enemies, plenty of them. Some, perhaps, with motive enough to kill him. Who would know? Aunt Agatha. As soon as you can get a call through to Ivy Bridge, you telephone her. Perhaps she can help. You feel better when she arrives at the apartment late in the afternoon. I'm so glad you've come, Aunt Agatha. I've made a terrible model of things. I wish there was some way I could help, dear. You... You believe Perry, don't you? Believe what? He's getting stuck in the ditch and having the man help him. I... I don't know. What do you mean? He acted so strangely with Rodney last night. I tried to make him understand. The first thing I knew, Rodney said some things he shouldn't have said. And there was a horrible scene. Perry went into a blue rage and threatened Rodney. I had to leave Claudia. I was afraid of him. What's that? Oh, the back door blew open. Oh, I'll get it. Oh, leave it. It's so hot. Oh, Magatha, he couldn't. I know Perry has a temper, but, but he's kind and good. Oh, don't you see? It must have been someone else. But who, dear? Oh, I don't know. But Uncle Rodney had lots of enemies. There must have been someone who would gain something by his death. Don't you see? Perry had nothing to gain and everything to lose. But he wasn't <laughs> thinking clearly, dear. Oh, you must know of someone else. That's really why I asked you to come here. There must be someone. Why, I don't know. Agatha, they can't convict him just because he can't prove an alibi, can they? Well, I think that's pretty important. The inspector said something about more positive evidence. What did he mean? Why, I don't know. The lighter, perhaps. The... The what? His cigarette lighter. They found it next to the body. Next to the... Well, that's, that's impossible. What do you mean? He didn't have it last night. He left it in the pocket of his raincoat. I had it. I used it right there in the house. And when I came back this morning, I left the coat. Agatha. Somebody took that lighter out of the coat and put it near the body before the police arrived. Afternoon, madam. Edmund, what are you doing here? You must at the door, Miss Agatha. Eavesdropping. So, that's it. You, Edmund. Better take it easy, madam. I've got a gun. The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. Meantime, I'd like to tell you about two live-wire young Californians who typify the more conscientious, more thorough service your car gets from a privately owned signal station. I'm talking about Bud Morley and Frank Sager, who just a year ago took over their own signal station in Burbank, California. Both, of course, had had years of experience servicing cars. Well, before long, Bud Morley and Frank Sager had more than doubled their business. Now, there must be good reasons for such success, and there are. Those boys are friendly, courteous, eager to please. They not only give service with a smile 
but include many little unasked-for extras. For after all, being in business for themselves, they have a personal reason for keeping customers so well-pleased they'll come back again and again. And there, friends, you have the important difference in signal service, a difference in thoroughness and conscientiousness that can add so much to the life of your car. What's more, it costs nothing extra. It's ready for your car at your neighborhood signal gasoline dealers. And now, back to the Whistler. Well, Claudia, it came to you in a flash the minute Agatha mentioned the lighter. Edmund. The peculiar remarks he made when you arrived at the house last night. I'm not disturbed, he said. And then something about being free after 20 years. Yes, it all fits together now, Claudia. Too bad he's standing in front of you with a gun in his hand. You're being very foolish, Edmund. You think you can get away with this? Matter of fact, madam, that's precisely what I was going to ask you. What do you mean? Edmund, you took the lighter, didn't you? You put it in the bedroom next to the body before the police arrived. Begging your pardon, Mrs. Elliot, but if I may say so, you're underestimating my intelligence. Do you think I'd be so foolish as to plant a piece of evidence which I knew wasn't there at the time of the killing? I saw you use the lighter, you know. I took your coat. Edmund, I refuse to listen. That will be enough from you, Miss Agatha. You'll have your chance to talk directly. Inspector Dutton is on his way. What do you mean? I heard you saying that Mr. Perry had nothing to gain, Mrs. Elliot, that perhaps there was someone with a bit more of a payoff, you might say. Don't listen to him, Claudia. Edmund, what are you trying to say? Mr. Rodney was determined to change the will in Mr. Perry's favor, madam. But he didn't. He planned to call the lawyer this morning. He told me to remind him just before the unfortunate incident. So you see, there was someone who stood to lose everything if he'd lived. If you hadn't tried to make it too perfect, Miss Agatha. Agatha! He's lying. The monster's making this up. The small matter of the cigarette lighter, you see. Only you could have made the mistake of thinking Mr. Perry had left his raincoat at the house. And the lighter in the pocket. You beast. You can't prove it, you can't. You have a chance to talk, madam. And you'd better be working on your speech. Inspector Dutton is a mighty critical listener. Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program, directed by George W. Allen, with tonight's story by Harold Swanton, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Marvin Miller speaking and suggesting that you let every traffic signal remind you that you do go farther with signal gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with signals.